worldwide impact that George Floyd's mm -hmm. death did. Okay, the president did say this. But on Martin Luther King Day, Republicans brought the year-old clip back as a battle over the voters' rights bill looks to be getting dirty. We're going to give you the 360 view on President Biden's full comments and what this means for the legislation. Plus, society is becoming more liberal, including the next generation, in large part because of pop cultural push for an ideological revolution to reflect Hollywood's progressive views. However, the tribulations being faced by the American people currently is motivating them to vote Republican. We're going to discuss. I'm Sky Nell Hughes, and these topics plus more with our expert guest on today's News Views Hughes. Thank you for joining me. And while we've heard a lot about the FBI spending hundreds of hours on arresting those involved with the events of January 6th at the Capitol, once again, another terrorist event has happened here in the United States, which does not fit the anti-conservative ideology narrative. Therefore, it has received only the minimum attention by the mainstream. But not here. And now we are finding out that Malik Faisal Akram was known by MI5 agents and even investigated by UK intelligence in 2020, following a tip he could possibly be an Islamic terrorist threat. He was also put on a list of subjects of interest, but did not cross the threshold for a full-blown investigation. Now, Akram did have a history of mental illness and an extensive criminal report, including a violent assault with a bat on a member of his own family. In fact, British police had even tried to locate him three weeks ago, but the reason has not yet been released. They had no luck because he was already in the United States. So how did a mentally irrational, violent man who used to be on a terrorist list in the UK how was he able to fly from the UK to JFK, then on to Texas, gain a gun, and hold four people hostage for 11 hours, including a rabbi in Colleyville, Texas, before being shot dead? Well, let us ask our, ask our expert and bring in Drew Berquist, former counterterrorism officer and host of This Is My Show with Drew Berquist. Hey, it's good to be here again, Scotty. Thanks for having me. Drew, this is extremely frustrating. Does the United States not share global intelligence database privileges with other countries to prevent situations like this? Yeah, absolutely. It kind of begs the question, what are we making all these lists for if we're not going to actually track and follow the lists? You know, I worked in counterterrorism for a long, long time, most of my adult career. And let, and let me first off say there's great people who work in our intel agencies and the people who are on the ground doing this. The problem is, is, is the American public and people around the globe have put a lot of faith and trust in our government systems, which I think is starting to, to come back down a little bit. But, but we, it's just too big of a bureaucracy to track this. And we do. We share intelligence with, with our allies, the Brits in particular. But, but this was a big failure. This is, this is a red flag. Obviously, some people can slip through the cracks, but when you've got a criminal record, you've got mental health issues, you've, you've ranted at the, the magistrate court over 9-11, all sorts of red flags here. And, and the fact that this happened is a huge mar on the, on the IC here and, and intel folks across the sea. Okay, so then do you actually think knowing what you know, did U.S. intelligence know someone like Malik was in the United States? Well, here's what I think is telling, is, is the fact that if you, if you understand kind of how, and I know that not everyone does because they didn't live in that world, but if you understand the intel community, if you understand the law enforcement community, and the FBI kind of bleeds into both of those, if, if, you, if you know when HRT, the hostage rescue team, which is an elite group who works there with the Bureau, when you know when they're used and they're not used that frequently, a lot of times local law enforcement will be, will be used for these types of issues. It's faster for a number of reasons. But the fact that they were there, the fact that this ended the way it did, despite the, the fact that the, the hostages broke free without their, their help, tells you a lot, and it would lead, it lead you to think that there was at least something there, maybe not a ton of intelligence, but at least something where, like, oh, this is not going to look good. Uh, we did know something, and we failed here. Interesting. Well, here's my thing. Why is there not a law prohibiting these individuals from traveling into the United States? And should there be? I mean, considering people who make, you know, some sort of disruption, rightfully so, by not wearing a mask on an airline or on a no-fly list, wouldn't this be a good individual that would possibly also be on that no-fly list, even flying here in the United States? Yeah, absolutely. Look, our, our country is not a country without security. People can talk about every issue they want, whether it's putting parents at school boards on, on domestic terror lists or what have you. If we're not a safe country, if we're not secure, none of those issues matter. You've got to have that first. And we've got to be more bold in how we handle this. And, and we have watch lists for a reason. Now let's use them and let's also expand them. And I'm not talking about crazy. It's literally just following the rules of the watch list. There's, there's, there's rules in place. There's forms in place. There's data transfers and systems in place. Let's just actually use those and not feel bad like, oh, this could come off wrong if we say something wrong about this person. We could hurt someone's feeling. Who cares? We've got to protect our country. So so real quick, do you think this will actually make things be tighter now that they've actually had this, this situation happen? No. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> okay. I don't. You know, right. I, I know the government that I work for. I know the intentions of the people who work in the government will want to fix it. But the leaders at the top who have been highly politicized are our current administration. I just don't, unfortunately, see this getting changed because it will look bad for, for their polling. Thank you, Drew Burquist, former counterterrorism officer and host of This Is My Show with Drew Burquist. Talk to you soon. Now, there's been lots of rule, new rules and regulations being mandated today, which I could never imagine being allowed, almost all being put into place in the name of public health. But if you cannot see those in power utilizing this excuse to create a vacuum of your rights, then you need to wake up. 
There is a new totalitarian world view to redefine sexuality, control health choices, and justify crimes committed by politicians and social justice groups. Recent news out of Canada confirms this. And what began with the government forcing religious institutions to shut their doors and the imprisonment of pastors who defied their orders, all in trying to control the spread of the coronavirus. After two years, those same doors have not been allowed to fully open again. And therefore, without reinforcement, the weakening of convictions by those who attend. This has resulted in the fast track passing of Bill C-4 through Parliament without debate or much public scrutiny. Natasha Sweet's going to bring us the details, plus a very lenient sentencing for a transgender woman because she could be victimized as a trans woman in an adult facility. Assault on crime policy from the L.A. District Attorney is upsetting victims' families. Seeking justice, one family is looking to try and recall George Gascon yet again, this time about a case of a trans woman sexually assaulting their then 10-year-old daughter. But Gascon says it's complicated. After two efforts to try and recall Los Angeles District Attorney George Gascon, there may be a third in the making. A 26-year-old transgender woman has pleaded guilty to sexually assaulting a 10-year-old girl back when she was 17. The plea comes only after Hannah Tubbs became questioned through DNA. But Gascon's most recent policy to immediately stop prosecuting children as adults makes this case, as he says, complicated. Tubbs will be sentenced later this month and will either stay at a juvenile hall, granted probation, or be housed in an adult facility. Tubbs has also been arrested in the past for other offenses, including battery, drug possession, and probation violations in Idaho and Washington. And while some in Los Angeles are outraged over a lack of discipline for criminals, another matter involving the trans community is also firing up one L.A. pastor, John MacArthur, of Grace Community Church. Many pastors in Canada are going to stand up in their pulpits and preach biblical sexual morality. This is critical, obviously, because people need to be converted from that sin. MacArthur received a letter from a fellow pastor in Canada. He learned about a new law against conversion therapy. But many are questioning whether it means that a parent can go to jail for supporting his child's gender he or she was given at birth. Pastor James Coates of Grace Life Church in Alberta, Canada is speaking out against the matter. He was also imprisoned for keeping his congregation open during the COVID lockdowns. Coates and 4,000 other Canadian pastors dedicated their most recent sermons this past Sunday to what they call sexual sin. All are in protest of the new Canadian bill C4 that went into effect on January 8th. Now, similar legislation has already passed in the U.S. and states like California, New York, New Jersey, and Nevada. C4 was fast-tracked through the Canadian Parliament, and those counseling against the new law could face a five-year jail sentence. Reporting for Newsviews Hughes and Tasha Sweet, RT. So to discuss the legality of the case, we bring in former assistant U.S. attorney under Reagan administration, David Katz. David, thanks for joining me. Great to be with you, Scotty. Okay, so let's start off with what does the law say if the crime was committed as a juvenile, but the perpetrator is not found out until an adult? Where do they serve out their punishment normally? Well, generally speaking, uh, in a heinous crime, the person can be treated as an adult. We don't categorically treat people who are 17 and 11 months old um, as a juvenile uh, in, a, in an appropriate case like the one here uh, with Tubbs, uh, you know, where there's a 10-year-old victim who's going to be traumatized for the rest of her life, but Tubbs happened to be two weeks short of 18. We give our prosecutors discretion uh, to treat the person as an adult, and that's why this inflexible policy of Gascon is really getting him into trouble. It is, but should there be, this brings up to the bigger picture, where, where obviously political ideologies get involved. Should special consideration be given to those convicted of violent crimes if they identify as trans today? Well, I don't think that they should be. Certainly, we didn't have a lot of this issue when I was uh, head of the task force for fraud under President Reagan. But, um, you know, you do try to accommodate a particular prisoner. So a prisoner shouldn't be put in a situation where the prisoner is going to be raped or sexually assaulted. But, you know, now that there are more trans people, uh, the prisons are, are committed to, to deal with it. And like in the case of this person, the sheriff here has said that the sheriff will put tubs in a custodial situation for two years where the person will be safe. So, no, I think generally speaking, uh, if you do the time, you have to, if you do the crime, you have to do the time, uh, whether you're trans or you're not trans. So are the victims, when it comes to sentencing, ever given consideration or, say, in punishment in situations like this? Well, the victims are given huge consideration, both as a matter of state law and federal law. They have a right to be heard. They have a right to have their trauma or other situation considered. And that's, what, that's why this is like the talk of talk radio right now here in Southern California and why Gascon really may face a recall and really may be booted from office. Because in these situations where you have a particularly aggrieved victim and their family and they come forward and they say, make an exception in this case, DAs make exceptions. I mean, we don't have artificial intelligence. We have real human intelligence and discretion. And we used it in the Reagan administration in appropriate cases and Gascon needs to use it. And if he doesn't use it, you can see why the voters are going to be upset about this and a couple of other celebrated cases where it seems like he's been inflexible. Well, and ultimately, like I said, I don't want to talk about transgender rights. That has nothing to do in this situation. I don't think that plays a card, except could we see the transgender card being played in the future like the insanity card? And while that might lessen the sentence in this case as what obviously uh, the lawyers wanted to do, could that actually be a major setback, setback to the transgender movement to be put in that category? 
Well, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, people have a lot of different feelings about it. Um, but I think that in terms of the criminal justice system, as I say, whether he identified as a male or a female, it's unquestioned that when he was just two weeks short of 18, he went into a Denny's out here in Southern California and molested this girl and would have kept molesting her, except he was stopped in the act. And uh, you can't have people do that. You obviously have to prosecute them. And the idea that he just goes to juvenile hall now that he's 26, that makes very little sense. But it also makes very little sense to people that a 26-year-old who's been arrested on battery and other charges since the incident when he was just about 18, uh, it shouldn't make any difference in whether it's a he, a she, or a trans. None of that should make any difference. There should be appropriate punishment, safe punishment, but there should be punishment and rehabilitation for people who commit heinous crimes. David, always great to speak with you. Thank you for giving us a clear answer to a very complicated situation. Now after the break, parents have been given a good look at what their children have been learning in the classroom over the last two years. So imagine the anger when parents found out their children had been learning chants praising cannibalism all in the name of multiculturalism. We're going to tell you how a win for parents has equaled a loss for devil worship in one California school system. Senate Democrats are still pushing to debate their voting rights legislation, despite Republicans pushing back, saying this is just a way to make less accountability and open to fraud in U.S. elections. While Democrats are drawing the argument as racial, saying Republicans don't want minorities to have equal access to voting, Republicans circulated a comment from President Biden from June of 2020, all to enrage the public on a day when a legend of civil rights is honored. But whether or not the Voting Rights Integrity Act passes, American society is becoming more liberal with issues like sexual freedom and gender roles. However, opinions are not what matters in the voting box, as the reality of today is causing most to favor conservatives or anyone opposite the party in charge. To discuss this, Randy Watkins, professor and editor at large for Salon Magazine, and alongside Malik Abdul, conservative commentator. Thanks for joining Malik and D. Hello. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get to this clip of Joe Biden, let's look at this mistrust. As Edelman's new 2022 Global Trust Barometer says a majority of people globally believe those in the media and business leaders are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things that are known as false or gross exaggeration. And let me point out, we're not in that category. <laughs> let me start with you, Dee. Do you agree that people actually have less trust today, if it was even possible, than years past? Absolutely. It's because we have access to so much information. We're being told so many different things by so many different people, and it's become overwhelming to a lot of people. You have whole news networks that have a liberal agenda. You have whole news networks that have a conservative agenda. And you have everybody in the middle trying to figure out what side they want to take. So I, I think that if you're not an informed viewer, then it's easy to, to get sucked up and duped, and that's making a whole lot of people lose trust. And I love the fact that people now with so much information, they can stay in their own little mecca of information and hear what they want to hear, their own little dome. Which brings me to you, Malik. What is having the biggest impact on U.S. society, do you believe, going to the left? But it's funny because they're still they're voting Republican because it's the opposite of the party in power. I think that there are a lot of um, the American people obviously are concerned about the economy and COVID and many of the other things. I think what's happening is, is that many of us in media and across you know, social media, we push things that people just really aren't concerned about. This um, debate about voting rights, it's not a top issue, not only in the black community, but even around the country. But Democrats have been successful in this. And I think the shift, realizing that many of the things that they were promised under a Joe Biden administration now not happening, I think that's starting to explain some of the push or malaise that people are having now that Joe Biden is in the White House. Well, Malik, I'm going to keep you in the hot seat on this one because President Biden said last summer the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King lacked the worldwide impact of George Floyd's murder. Now, Republicans left it there, but the rest of the clip puts this in regards to technology and phone usage now being able to give people the option to see for themselves. Let's take a listen. Because just like television changed the civil rights movement for the better when they saw Bull Connor and his dogs ripping the clothes off of elderly black women going to church and fire hoses ripping the skin off of young kids. That, all those folks around the country who didn't have any black populations heard about this, but didn't believe it, but they saw it. Yeah, context matters. Now, Malik, Republicans accuse Democrats all the time for taking their words out of context. So is the fact that they kind of did the same thing, the best strategy, you think, to push back on this voting rights bill being made into just a racial argument by the Democrats? From a, from a uh, strategic political perspective, it's absolutely beneficial for Republicans to uh, pile on Biden with this particular um, clip. I actually didn't see the fuller clip until you just played it, and I still have a problem with it because Joe Biden has a tendency to say things that are particularly inappropriate. Joe Biden can actually make the same case about George Floyd to 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, 
uh, Pearl Harbor even. All of these things were pre-technology, pre-social you know, social media, and in the case of 9-11 and many of the other things that happened well before then, even wars, there were no phones. There were no many of these things. So Joe Biden, much like he did when he said, you know, when he determined who is and who ain't black, and some of the other things that he said even recently about Jim Crow, you know, this is what Joe Biden does, and there are people, unfortunately, around him who've made him comfortable thinking that these type of things are appropriate, but I don't give him a pass on this because his comments across the board here are just inappropriate. Okay, he stayed in the hot seat. D, what are your thoughts? I understand what he was trying to do, and the fact of the matter is we all know that Joe Biden has never been known for his clever and pretty and creative way with words, right? He's blunt and he's to the point. And one of the biggest problems why so many citizens and so many people are frustrated is because all of these politicians across the board, regardless of whatever party you subscribe to, pander to black people in different ways. And then when they get the actual jobs, you know, well, we know most Republicans, um, even a lot of black Republicans are just anti-black in general. Um, we were talking points or we're something to bring up when they're trying to persuade a certain crowd to think a certain way. But then we're starting to see, well, not starting to see, but for years we've saw the same thing from liberals who are supposed to be pro a lot of black agendas. They get the job and then we get swept to the back end. It's just now um, I, we all have these platforms to acknowledge it at a high level. Well, authenticity is very important. I appreciate both of you for always being authentic when you come on this show. Thank you so much. Last March, the mandatory new ethnic studies curriculum introduced by the California State Board of Education included the teaching that white Christians had created the genocide against indigenous people, replacing their gods with biblical gods. Now, the students were encouraged by the curriculum to establish for their generation a new a social order characterized by counter-genocide and counter-hegemony. Plus, taught to sing praises to Tezcatlipoca, the Aztec deity who served as the god of human sacrifice and cannibalism, all in order for them to become warriors for social justice. Now, as you can imagine, parents were very upset and challenged the new curriculum in the courts. Their first victory has been handed to them, with the Inlock Act affirmation being permanently banned. So to discuss, let us bring back Ed Martin, president of Phyllis Shafley's Eagles and the publisher of EagleActionReport.com. Great to be with you, Scotty. Okay. Who is introducing elements like this? Tributes to satanic deities. Who's doing this into our children's education? Well, look, the facts of the matter are it's not one sort of fringe group at this point. What we've seen is the general slide of our education system from higher ed down through all of our, you know, K through 12. It's not one group, right? I mean, look, CRT, which has gotten so much attention in the last year or so, which is about critical race theory and about this idea of teaching about race, that's only the, the sort of tip of the iceberg. As you point out, we have satanic groups that are on our campuses, K through 12. In the, in the uh, curriculum, as you point out, we're putting aside the biblical teaching. Remember, Scotty, and I, and your listeners and your viewers need to remember, America's founding was and is as a Judeo-Christian country, a nation brought together. It didn't mean you had to be Christian or Jewish. It meant that our values were going to come out of that tradition. What you're watching, whether it's tearing down statues or inserting curriculum like this, is a destruction of our America, our nation. It's a threat to who we are, and it's an attack on our very founding. Well, it's interesting because we can talk about California, but these unwelcome invitations are happening in other parts of the country as well. Illinois yeah. Elementary School was invited to after school Satan Club. Flyer given out promoting yeah. an approach to science of the world we live in. Is that why? How is schools letting this happen? Are they doing it under multiculturalism and science? Well, they're doing it under uh, stupidity, and frankly, they're doing it because they hate people and they don't believe in uh, the people, the goodness of people. Look, we have the USA Today floating the notion and then retracting that pedophilia is something that is not uh, only innate in certain people, but they find it in the womb. Look, there are certain things that are true and false. Satan is evil and shouldn't be exposed to our children, let alone ourselves. Pedophilia is not something that should be described as some condition you have. It is something that is truly evil. And what we're seeing is more and more people in power who are godless and have no values.